Hey, deserving listeners, as some of you know, I have recently made a couple episodes doing a deep dive on narcissistic personality, and there's been a lot of follow-up and a lot of clarifications, and I thought I would have John, a, I, I always want to say attack, but it's, it's, is it attack? It's attack. It, it means at oak. Uh, at what? At Oak, it, it's in, and the name originally meant that my ancestors lived underneath an oak tree somewhere. Oh, at we're, we're not aggressive at all, I promise. At Ack. So, John, as some of you know, has been on the podcast before talking about how to help people recover from high control relationships such as exist in cults and how his research and his... his um, his expertise helps clinicians to have a, a much uh, better approach to that uh, of all understanding it, but also in terms of how to, how to actually help people and not harm them. Uh, welcome back to the podcast, John. Thank you. It's good to be here, Kirk. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. John, why don't you introduce yourself to podcast land? Well, I'm the um, director of projects at the Open Minds Foundation, which is um, a charity established in the US um, that seeks to help people to safeguard their kids, uh, their friends and their families from all sorts of uh, influence, bullying, cyberbullying, fake news, cult involvement, radicalization, um, joining gangs, becoming part of an abusive relationship. Because what we found is that um, the same dynamics and the same psychology apply in all of these situations. So we, our main goal is to be preventative, to alert people to the signs so that they won't become trapped in a, an abusive relationship or group. Yeah, and you've talked about how clinicians sometimes will uh, inadvertently, because they're ignorant of the process, harm their clients by uh, challenging directly the belief system that they might have either in the midst of being in some of those high control relationships or um, as they're being extracted from them and how the, that can cause the client to feel alienated from the therapist and doesn't actually help them. And uh, uh, you've talked at length in these other episodes about how uh, you train people to actually work within their belief system and uh, work at your, you know, you have your eye on helping them extract themselves, but, but you're not directly attacking it the way that some people do. Uh, do I, am I wording this right? Yes. Yeah, so <clears throat> it's very much the point that, that the objective as the objective should be with all therapy is to bring about autonomy in the client, um, emotional and intellectual autonomy. And, you can't do that by head on saying, well, you know, what you believe is wrong and I'm going to prove that to you. Um, you need to have a, an empathetic and sympathetic relationship with the person um, so that they'll be willing to open up and, and talk about these issues. I think there's also there's you know, the cookie cutter approach that we find sometimes, you know, somebody's done a course in cognitive behavioral therapy or something and they just then try and apply that to everybody. and you have to be, you have to listen, you know, you have to listen actively and, and see what the problem really is. And often you'll find that the person, I, I talk about the cultic shell, that, that people have built up a kind of defense against any comment about the group they're in. And so you have to help them to escape from that cultic shell before you can um, get them to commit to any sort of therapeutic intervention. So it's fascinating stuff. If you're interested as a listener, you can listen to some of the other episodes that we've had with John. Um, so I wanted to talk with you about narcissism within these cults and or other similar organizations and, and the leaders. Have, have you studied people like Charles Manson, David Koresh, these kinds of people in relation to narcissism? Yeah, I, I've read a lot about Charles Manson. He, of course, was involved with Scientology, and, and he said, you know, from the age of 12, 
he spent more time in institutions and prisons than out of them. And <clears throat> during his last stay in prison, he was introduced to Scientology, probably through a group called Criminon, which was a front group for Scientology. And he says in his autobiography, uh, which was authored by a man called Noel Emmons, um, who's, I believe, the only person who actually interviewed Manson extensively. A lot of people have speculated about Manson, but he interviewed him for many hours. And he said that he had 150 hours of Scientology counseling or auditing. And that's what gave him the confidence to form the family. So, uh, and two of the members of the family had also been involved in Scientology. So there is, you know, this rather perverse link. Manson's a very complicated character. Um, as is often the case, he was not tremendously intelligent. He certainly wasn't educated, but he was very cunning. Um, you know, he has a, a sort of vulpine, a fox-like sophistication in his thinking at times. And, you know, the thought that he, you know, re recorded two songs with the Beach Boys is always <laughs> sort of, that, that's always sort of put me, knocked me sideways after Brian Wilson had disappeared from the scene. But he so wanted to be part of this scene and then his um, delusions, because I think with Manson, you're not simply dealing with a narcissist. You're dealing with somebody who's delusive. You know, he believed in Helter Skelter, you know, the John Lennon. He took the title of the John Lennon song. And from there said that a war is going to come between uh, the whites and the blacks in America, and we must kickstart that war. And so the murders committed by the his gang were supposed to kickstart this thing into into action so there would be a civil war in the united states um pretty much the same sort of logic you find in the the patios the symbionese liberation people the, right i mean th there was a lot of that sentiment and it wasn't far-fetched at the time given no. the tensions and how destabilized things were and how how much injustice and how the system was just not flexing very much in particular communities. So um, that's something that, you know, I was born in 1970, so I, I can't relate at all, but studying history enough, I have come to realize there was, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty at that time. It, it wasn't, it wasn't a strange thought to believe that there could be something along those lines. And, you know, there were, small incidents for sure i mean small compared to a civil war but big compared to you know we well, had the watts riots for example in the yeah. late 60s you had the chicago days of rage in 68 and um looking at the early 70s there were close on 2000 bomb attacks a year in the united states in the early 70s which you know we've got homeland security and all of this going on now but i don't think people realize just how much uh, less dangerous the environment in, is now than it was in the, at the beginning of the 70s. Yeah, well, let's make America great again and return to that. Yeah, I, it's funny, actually, because I was watching um, Donald Trump and American Dream, a, a four-hour set of documentaries, and I hadn't realized, of course, Ronald Reagan campaigned with let's make America great again, and so did Bill Clinton. It was just, So it's a slogan that seems to be I'm still wondering when when it was great because I think America's great now, you know. Yeah. And I'm speaking as an outsider. I I think America is, is since the Second World War has contributed a great deal of good to the rest of the world. It's also sadly contributed a great deal of harm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's a I didn't know Charles Manson uh, went to Scientology. That that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, what have you? gleaned from your understanding of Charles Manson regarding his narcissistic personality? Well, as I say, he's a narcissist. He's, he's somebody who is completely self-obsessed and self-focused. So he fits the personality profile of most cult leaders. If you look at, I know, Bhagwan, as he called himself, Sri Rajneesh. Uh, Bhagwan, by the way, means supreme god. So, you know, that, that could be considered slightly narcissistic. Um, then you had Mahesh, who called himself Maharishi, great teacher. Sun Myung Moon, Ron Hubbard, these people all seem to be characteristic um, of, of the narcissistic personality disorder. And I'm sure you've made the differentiation elsewhere, but 
the word narcissist has crept into the language and become there's a confusion i think between people who are um show-offs or performers you know like david bowie or elton john who could be called narcissistic because of the way they behave in public at times but that is not the narcissistic personality disorder right the disorder, yeah. the, it went yeah. into a lot of detail on that yeah the, the, the general public throws around the word narcissistic like applied to basically any celebrity that they're not fond of you know yeah. it's just like i don't like kim kardashian she's a narcissist and it's mm. it's like well if you want to say she's you don't like the way she presents herself or you've had enough of her or mm. uh, but it's like one uh you're not applying that label to celebrities that you do like and two yeah. this is how they make their living this is mm. they, they literally pay the bills by taking pictures of themselves and and putting it on instagram so um, you know, it's hard to know what their actual personality is like, right? Absolutely. And show people need to be show people. We, you know, <laughs> we, we'd all sit at home and, you know, in a dark corner if it weren't for having entertainers out there. And they, they need to exhibit that and show that. Um, so, so having said that, if, if you look to somebody, you know, Ron Hubbard is the easiest example for me because I've spent far too much of my life um, studying his life and work and he's somebody who there's a differentiation made between a vulnerable and a grandiose narcissist by some people and the, the vulnerable narcissist and I I'm sure that Hubbard was a vulnerable narcissist if they don't have adulation they collapse they they you know he would lock himself away for days on end we have interviews with people had a girlfriend in 1950 who became a psychologist after they parted company and she talked about him, you know, sitting and sulking in his bed and then going out and giving a lecture about, you know, how you could become a perfect human being. And he'd, he'd drink a bottle of whiskey a day and, and cry. Um, I talked with his, one of his closest associates in the 60s, John McMaster, who, who gave me the same story. He talked with a guy who was looking after him in the 70s, same story, all through his life. He was a vulnerable narcissist. So the adulation becomes the fuel. Um, these are people who have, you know, they have to have the admiration of other people and they're willing to do anything to get it. Grandiose narcissists, on the other hand, just look in the mirror and go, I am the fairest of them all. That there is never any doubt in their minds that, that they are perfect and wonderful. Um, I, you know, I, it's, I, I can't off the top of my head come up with an example of that without getting into trouble. Yeah, it, that's the the my experience with so the vulnerable narcissist. the The way I would phrase it is, um, I mean, you're presenting, you know, uh, exactly what I have found clinically is that people will uh, a, develop a defensive structure of a grandiose self or gaining ad adulation from other people as a way to defend against this deep inferiority and this is deep lack of self mm. you know they're, they're not um they're not just like mildly into being a show-off they they need it in the way that uh, we need water or food mm. or air and when they don't have it they uh are not distracted enough from the reality that they don't know even who they are as a human being because yes. they, were, yeah. they, they were abused or they were mistreated or neglected enough as a child that they, they weren't given enough of time when they were a young child to actually develop a sense of who they were and what they want or that they're actually a good person on the inside. Mm -hmm. And that's something that unless you, you know, like for, for me, I have a self because my parents raised me well enough that I actually – when I look inside, there's a there's a person in there, you know. Mm -hmm. And for people out there, if you if you also have a self, you'll be like, well, what does that even mean? And it was really hard for me to get um, until I actually experienced it firsthand. You know, when you actually experience someone without a self, it is a it takes a while to really get like, wow, this person actually doesn't even know who they are or what they want. Would they ask themselves? What do I want from my life? There is no voice. There is nowhere to even look because yeah. 
they just don't know who they are. And so, so not only that, but there's a, it, and it's so, and it's not an intellectual experience of not knowing who you are. It's actually extremely distressful to look inside and see nothing. It feels like falling into an abyss and mm. very dysregulating. We, we evolved to need that critical phase early in life to develop that self. And when we don't have it, th- there's an extremely horrible feeling of emptiness that people will feel. And people will turn to various different methods of coping, one of which can be narcissism. And so with L. Ron Hubbard, apparently, he was deeply suffering and deeply disturbed. And the Scientology cult project that he uh, involved himself in it was some semblance of respite from his deep despair. Um, the grandiose narcissist, in my experience, also has that. They're just much better at blocking themselves off from it. They, yeah. um, they have that deep emptiness and that deep suffering, but they've, they're in such a state of denial and so good at propping up this defensive structure of narcissism that they rarely experience it. Or when they do, just they, they get a hint of it, they will strike out at someone else as a way of like, establishing dominance over someone else as a way of it because that's another way you can gain narcissism is through dominance like i am i am dominant over you i'm better than you i'm superior yep. than you. and so and, and have control yeah right and and so but in my experience both people are are deeply deeply suffering on the inside mm-hmm. not that i'm excusing their behavior i'm not i'm just saying that's why they resort to such strange and elaborate defenses and they learn these defenses early in life it's not like they are an adult and suddenly they realize how to how to defend against that emptiness probably from the age of like two or three or four they had the beginnings of a narcissistic personality a way of showing off a way of being dominant a way of distracting themselves anyway and i think there are two roots you mentioned the root of abuse um but in studying hubbard so many people have said, oh, he must have been abused as a child. And um, I have seen absolutely no evidence of that. And, you know, we did, we were able to interview his aunt who lived in the house with him throughout his childhood. Um, We've seen correspondence from his mother. And um, it seems to me that the other possible route is that the child is um, overvalued. That, that the child, the expectation placed upon the child is is too much. It interested me that in, in looking at Sun Myung Moon, the founder of um, the Moonies, the Unification Church, as it calls itself, that, that he too was brought up in the household of a grandparent rather than his father being the head of the household, his uh, grandfather was. Uh, Hubbard was brought up by Lafayette in Lafayette Waterbury's household, and his father was absent most of the time. And you have this idea of his mother and his four doting aunts and his grandfather all having this incredible expectation of him that he was going to be this fantastic, wonderful man. And he really didn't, apart from having a, a natural cunning, he really didn't have a lot going for him. He, he was not a highly educated man. He was not capable of becoming highly educated. He was thrown out of university in the first year. Um, but I think that that expectation was always in the back of his mind. And he turned towards abusing others, it would appear, as a teenager. He started, again, if you look at Rajneesh, uh, there's a story that when he was, I think, about eight years old, he uh, convinced one of his school friends to walk a tightrope, and the friend fell and died. And you know, this risk-taking and forcing others to take risks is a normal part of sociopathic behavior so there's this I, I think there's another possible route to it that the self doesn't develop because it, the expectation is impossible you know you're, you're going to be a buddha or a world leader or, or something like this and you're told this from the moment you're born it makes it impossible um i, I think also i've recently read uh, escape from freedom written by in 1941 by Eric the Great Eric Fromm. And he takes Freud to task and says, you know, well, 
Freud says that selfish people only love themselves, but the truth is that selfish people don't love anyone. And it's that lack of self-love that makes the narcissist um, so vulnerable because they can't sit down and go, well, I, you know, I've achieved things, I've done things. You know, at the end of his life, it's said that Hubbard commissioned a man called Sarge Fouth to build a, a machine based upon his Hubbard electrometer that would actually kill him. And he told Fouth that he'd failed, that his mission on earth, you know, to humanity was a complete failure. And that vulnerability, that collapsing, is an aspect of the condition. Right. The way that I've conceptualized people like Hubbard and Manson, and again, there's, it's just a way of narrativizing the story. There's it's not a scientific statement, you know, it's, it's based on, you know, empirical evidence and observation, but it's a, um, it's a way of drawing together a lot of different things to make it co coherent. And what's coherent to me is that Manson and Hubbard in all likelihood. So if Hubbard didn't have any overt um, abuse, which I would say, honestly, if it's just abuse, narcissism is not likely the defensive structure that will emerge. It has mm -hmm. to be a lack of parenting that allows the child to develop a self, which, which you mentioned and we've been talking about, but also some kind of um, vibe at the very least that the child is inferior and not important. And that can be done in the midst of what seems to be a very loving household, right? Mm -hmm. You can have a parents who are still together, who aren't violent, they don't drink, but if the parents are narcissistic themselves, or if they're depressed, or they work a lot, or um, postpartum, you know, uh, mental conditions, or um, just a variety of different things can actually uh, contribute to the development of narcissistic personality. Now, mm -hmm. it's hard to demonstrate that scientifically because it's such a yes. multifactorial yeah. sort of Let's descriptive. Skin a box throughout their childhood and watch them intently. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So we're left to speculate, but but that's been my experience clinically, and and I, mm -hmm. I would suspect it would be true for for Hubbard and and for Manson. I I don't. I, but Manson actually did go through some actual overt difficulties. And then what happens from the cult leader that uh, the way I story the situation is they are always grasping for some kind of narcissistic supply, something that makes them able to bolster this false self that helps them to feel like they have a self and feel like they are good enough in the world while also distracting them from the deep abyss and emptiness. And they so they don't start out wanting to be a cult leader. What they start out with is they just want some some um, ability to to elevate their self in other people's eyes. So, you know, they start off with say you know being a, a folk singer like with Charles Manson and getting people to listen to him sing songs, mm -hmm. or L. Ron Hubbard who wrote books. Right? Um, I don't know. I played the ukulele apparently as a teenager. Okay, so. <laughs> some kind of accolade and, and there would be this vacillation between like at times getting enough narcissistic supply where he can, they can feel normal, but then it's not enough or they eventually get there and say you're Charles Manson and you have like 10 people who love your music. Well, eventually you get used to it. You know, we get used to anything, right? Like yeah. Kanye yeah, West. Dose. Yeah, Kanye West is, um, I don't know his if he has narcissistic personality, but, you know, he... He is a high school dropout. <laughs> he did succeed a lot and always seemingly wants to, you know, keep succeeding as many, as many you know, successful people do. Anyway, my point is, is that eventually you habituate to that level of narcissistic supply and it no longer uh, feels good enough. And so you have to, you have to, you know, keep increasing. And so you're L. Ron Hubbard, you're thinking, well, how can I get people to be really into my books? You know, or um, if you're Manson, it's like, how, now I need people to listen to me pontificate about uh, Helter Skelter. I need to get, you know, I, I don't know if he cared about Helter Skelter, but it certainly was the zeitgeist at the time, you know, and, and he knew that it was an important element to a lot of people in California at the time. And so, you know, he, 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 
you know, Manson, now he's a preacher and then he has like followers and then he has to like get them to give away their possessions and live with them. And then he's got to have sex with them. And then he's got to get them to kill, you know, like every step up the ladder is like that just the next progression on, uh, because he's habituated to the current level of narcissistic supply. Um, I don't know that much about Hubbard though. Like does this apply to Hubbard? L. Ron Hubbard at all? Very much so. <clears throat> if you look at either my book, um, Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky, or the biographer Russell Miller's Barefaced Messiah, uh, which I, I worked on, um, you see a man who does inflate so that in 1950, it's enough to have a room full of people listening to him and be on the bestseller list. By the by 1967, he has to create an organization that it can take him away from um, national laws. So he puts to sea so that he can be outside of the, you know, he can do what he wants. And the behavior is, is marked. When I interviewed people who'd known him in the 1950s, and I interviewed a lot of people, um, most of them were, well, you know, you couldn't trust him to do things and he spent money like water. I heard that phrase a number of times from people. So you had to keep him away from the money. And he made all sorts of inflated promises. But people came away from their meetings with him saying, but you know, he's an interesting guy and you know, he got some very clever ideas. I mean, Carl Rogers and Fritz Perls both publicly praised Ron Hubbard's ideas. So he impressed some people there. Um, but that, you know, he was talking about, you know, dealing with trauma and the, you know, the trauma of childbirth or the, the trauma of infancy. Uh, and that became the trauma of past lives and that kind of expanded the picture. But by the 60s, he's inflicting trauma. He's taking these people, putting them in uniforms, putting them on a, a ship and throwing them overboard, um, which is you know, terrifying. This is worse than being thrown from the high diving board in a swimming pool. And there were people who couldn't swim it was being done to. Um, he was putting a child as young as four into the chain lockers in his ship, you know, the place where the anchor chain is normally stored, which is a filthy, squat little place full of bilge water and rats. And he was exerting this dominance over the people around him. So, so yeah, there was a progression with, with Hubbard. And I think probably with any of the cult leaders, they, they come to believe the myth they've created. Um, Hubbard, uh, in 1954, he, he wrote a, a poem, he called it, called The Hymn of Asia. And I talked with his um, editor and publisher, John Sanborn, who controlled all of his publications from 54 to 1978. And Sanborn said he didn't dare publish this thing because it was too embarrassing, because in it, Hubbard claimed to be Metea or Metreya, the future Buddha who will save all of humanity and take us all into Nirvana. And I'd just like to point out, it didn't happen. <laughs> you know, Hubbard's dead and we're still here. Um, but Sanborn told me that the poem begins with, Am I Mitea, the future Buddha? And uh, he said, the original said, I am Mitea. And that's why John held it for 20 years before publishing it, because of the massive egotism involved in this, this thought. And I think that he vacillated between believing he was the savior of all humanity and believing he was a complete charlatan. And I have records of conversations that he had with people. Um, a guy interviewed him and made a wonderful little documentary, which is up on YouTube, called The Shrinking World of L. Ron Hubbard. It's only 20 minutes long. And this guy, Charlie Nairn, went and interviewed him, and he said for an hour or two before the camera went on, Hubbard talked with him, and, and he said to him, it's a complete scam, isn't it? And Hubbard went, yeah, of course. <laughs> Just admitted it. And and it, so Charlie said, well, why, why do you do it? And he said, well, it's great to be able to give you, your wife $10,000 every evening on a silver tray and say, look what we earned today. This is 1968, $10,000 then $100,000 now, every day. But the main thing is I like to hook the clever ones and reel them in. So this idea of being better than other people, controlling other people, um, believing himself to be godlike superhuman i think was essential to his ego construction and as you say it, there's no self involved because 
that, that is not a realistic expectation for a human being. You know, we are fallible. Um, we have our strengths and we have our weaknesses. He had to be considered, you know, a great musician. He, um, he, he made an album called The Power of Source, um, which was atrocious. He took two years of Chick Corea's life to, to make a, an appalling pop album called Road to Freedom which was one of his final legacies before he died. Um, and it even has him singing, which is definitely, he sings, thank you for listening, I write just for you. It's very, very worth buying and listening. Is to. it on the internet? I oh, probably, <laughs> I haven't looked, but it, I, I remember cringing when I first heard it and the thought that a great musician like Chick Corea had wasted so much of his time working on this awful thing was you know, quite embarrassing, but you know, that's, that's for Chick to, to work out and not for me. So I just want to chime in here and say that the vast majority of people who suffer from narcissistic personality or what many experts, clinicians would um, you know, assess as such, do not do these kinds of things. They, they might emotionally abuse people around them. Um, they're prone to relationship difficulties, but... The vast majority, vast, vast majority are not cult leaders, um, wouldn't even try, and definitely are not murderers like Charles, or involved yeah. themselves in murdering like Charles Manson did. Uh, but that isn't to say that Charles Manson and Hubbard aren't uh, good examples of where narcissistic personality can go. And that narcissism, I mean, that the, there is a spectrum, and I, I think, you know, I, I very much like the idea of of looking at any uh, disorder on a spectrum um and so robert hare who wrote the hair psychopathy checklist revised which is the one that's being used these days um he eventually changed his mind about terminology in without conscience his book in the early 90s he dismisses the term sociopath and says that's people who believe that this is something that is socially constructed that such people are made was he at that time believed that the psychopath is born and i think you know i i keep recently citing shakespeare some are born great some achieve greatness and some have greatness thrust upon them and i think this is true of almost any psychiatric or psychological disorder that you can be born with it um, your environment can make it happen to you or it can be just shoved into you. And with narcissism, as you're saying, there's, there are good grounds to believe that your childhood nurture is, is a very significant, probably the most significant part of it. However, there is a great, Hare changed his mind. And in the book, Snakes in Suits, he says, well, I'm gonna say that anybody who scores from 30 to 40, and 40 is the highest mark you can get, on his checklist is a psychopath. Anybody who scores from four, which is what apparently the normal male scores, uh, to 30 is a sociopath of some order or another. And it, the characteristics of um, narcissistic personality disorder are characteristics of sociopathy and psychopathy, both of which terms are now excluded from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the APA, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, so we have many, many different opinions, but you will find the same selfishness, the same risk taking, the same charm um, in all of these people. It would appear from Kent Kyle's work, and he wrote an excellent book called The Psychopath Whisperer, that there is a physiological basis for what we would call criminal psychopathy, the murderers, the the people who are in prison. Um, he found that, that there was a deficit in the paralimbic system in the brain, basically connecting the old limbic brain to the prefrontal cortex. Um, apparently that deficiency is around about 7%. You've got to love numbers, haven't you? But he did um, very fine resolution fMRIs on hundreds of people held in prisons. To, to come to this idea. But at the other end, you have 
somebody like, say, James Fallon. Uh, Fallon um, wrote a wonderful book called The Psychopath Inside. And uh, he basically, he, he's a, a neuroscientist and professor there in California. And he runs two institutes that are, are dealing with, um, you know, genetics. And he had his family scanned to see if anybody had Alzheimer's plaque visible. And he had the, the 10 study, the, the 10 uh, images randomized. And he saw on one of them this deficit in the paralimbic system. And he said to his assistant, oh, you know, who's that? And the assistant kind of went, <clears throat> well, actually, that's you, Jim. And has written this, I say, The Psychopath Inside, a wonderful book where he, <clears throat> excuse me, he says that he, he calls himself a pro-social sociopath. Um, the reason I think this is wonderful is that he's a man who admits that he does do the things that a sociopath does. He um, took his brother on a trip to the Marburg Caves in Kenya, um, not telling his brother this is where Marburg Ebola came from. And his brother realized it when he got home. He says, you know, if he's meant to be going to a funeral and you invite him to a party, he'll go to the party. If you go out for an evening's entertainment with him and you're a bespectacled professor, you will end up drunk and dancing naked on a table. You know, he admits to a degree of mischief. But he says that his whole life, until he was about 50 years old, he believed everything was genetic, that there was nothing you could do about it. And his experience, he also has all three of the alleles that are associated with psychopathy. Uh, his mother told him that on his father's side, there were seven murderers in the family, including, including Lizzie Borden, apparently. And that she had realized when he was about two years old that there was something wrong with him. And so by very careful nurture, she managed to produce somebody who had this characteristic innately these characteristics innately, but was able to modify them to actually become a tremendously helpful human being. He's done great things with his life. So, uh, you know, I, I'm hesitant that, that we might start some kind of witch hunt. Um, you know, and, and, you know, Hubbard decided there were people who are suppressive persons. And I don't want to get into that simplistic uh, mindset. We don't necessarily know what to do with them yet, but there are ways of approaching this problem of, of labeling these people and understanding them. Right. My understanding of the research regarding the limbic system connection with the rest of the brain and executive functioning is that, and again, we just have to say our science is not good enough to understand uh, brain and personality. Uh, we're, you know, we're, we're heading in the direction, but I'm positive a hundred years from now, they're going to laugh at, you know, the kinds of things that we were saying about, you know, not necessarily wrong, but at least uninformed by the things they'll know in the future. But anyway, um, the notion goes that um, when you are born with the inability to feel fear or to allow fear to guide your development, mm -hmm. that you, you know, one of the ways that uh, our child development is is modulated is through the fear of disappointing your parents or the fear of your parents being upset at you. You know, there's, yeah. you, we want to please our parents and, and it's very frightening to a child to incur disappointment or to incur anger from a parent. And one of the uh, problems, if you don't have that innate ability, say at the age of two, three, four, that, you don't feel fear in general because that's another thing that's often associated with psychopathy is this fearlessness, this, this ability yeah. to just like jump off a building and not really care, you know, because you just don't, you're not frightened in the way that other people are and, yeah. or at least it doesn't guide your behavior in the way it does for other people. And so you don't develop correctly because when your parent turns to like, you know, you're, you're about to hit your, you know, your younger sister over the head with a, you know, with a plate and your parents will react emotionally. They don't just, you know, say, okay, Johnny, don't do that. They freak out, you know, like, what are you doing? You know? And for most kids, they will, that fear will be, you know, that emotionality will be detected by the, by the child. 
and it'll it'll actually scare the child. It'll be, yeah. you know, they'll have a physical yeah. scare, like what what's happening? You know, my parents are freaking out. You know, and they'll associate hitting you know someone over the head with a plate with with intense fear for themselves. And so the next time they think about hitting someone over the head with a plate, um, they actually will worry physically about the consequences of of doing that. Um, if, if you don't have fear, then you don't care. You just, you see your parents freaking out and you're like, huh, that's interesting. And then you hit your, you know, your sibling over the head with an, with a plate. And then that creates a whole other set of developmental experiences where the parents are now looking at you like, what's wrong with you? You know, like, um, that, and so that creates a whole other set of, you know, weird experiences that can develop later into a life where, the person just doesn't really have the empathy that, that other people have. And it's an interesting model of how we develop empathy, you know, that it's, it's modulated and developed through, through a fear response, right? That our morality is somehow um, at the foundation is some kind of fear of retribution from, from our parents or God or something, you know, now again, there's, there's, it's just a metaphor based on our, you know, very limited understanding of how things are going. But and and again, that there, there might be a spectrum that that it that we don't simply learn through our anxiety of you know learning that a behavior is is right or wrong. On the the work done on the brain, of course, much of this is work on the amygdala um, or amygdalae, uh, done by Joseph Ledoux and Bessel van der Kolk. And Ledoux two or three years ago, actually withdrew his findings. They're still being cited as the basis, usually. Um, but he feels that he may have overestimated some of these effects. And we're, that we're now hearing this term brain blob, the notion that specific regions of the brain are responsible for specific activities may not be universally true. Right. Um, so, so, yes, there are some questions. I would question the idea that there are simply fear responses. There are also empathy responses. And Simon Baron-Cohen, in, in his work, uh, Zero Degrees of Empathy, he's, of course, one of the leading um, workers uh, on the autistic spectrum and understanding that. And he talks about um, sociopaths being people who, who have, or psychopaths or narcissists, who, people who have... Um, a, a, a cognitive empathy, that they understand what other people are feeling, whereas um, people with Asperger's or on the autistic spectrum have difficulty in understanding how to react to people's feelings. Psychopaths have a really finely tuned sense of that. At the other end of the scale, on the autistic spectrum and with Asperger's, people tend to have very high effective empathy. They feel things very profoundly. This is the bit that's missing, not just the fear response, but the empathy that, that the psychopath is like, well, yeah, you know. And so you read stories of interviews with criminal psychopaths where uh, the one I remember from Kent Keel is, is uh, and he actually prints the interview. He gives the words of the guy. He said, well, you know, <laughs> this guy was in prison because he'd killed somebody. He hit somebody, knocked them off a barroom stool, banged their head, and they were dead. And there he is in prison. And he just says to the interviewer, which was probably Keel himself, well, you know, if you'd seen the way he looked at me, you'd have killed him too. That, so that lack of any response, not, not just fear, but a lack of empathy, the lack of emotion, um, which we learn culturally from our parents, as you say, by, by them being decent people. And, and let me you know, tune in and say that I was very fortunate to grow up in a in a loving family with loving parents and three loving brothers. Um, so I, you know, I, as you said of your own upbringing, I, this isn't something that happened to me. And my empathy for others was, was, was there from the beginning. It was always the feeling of um, not so much. You must thou shalt not behave in this way, but, but it's better to behave in this way. My parents were very honest, very honorable, very considerate people, and so that seemed the natural way to go. On top of that, uh, you know, I'm agnostic now, um, and I. But until the age of thirteen, I was I was a Christian. I was brought up within Christianity, and the 
positive moral notions of Christianity, like giving all you have to the poor, for example. I haven't seen a lot of people doing that. Um, but the positive, you know, the golden rule, which Buddhism also has of doing to other people what you'd like them to do to you, was something that was part of, you know, my normal life by the time I was four or five. That was the way you behave towards people. It was, in fact, only as an adult and after the harassment I received from Scientology that, that I started to think, you know, should I really be sacrificing my life to, to help people I've never met, you know, um, which is the, the basis of, of that idea. And uh, I'm not sure that I should, actually. But, um, yeah. So I think, I think there's a positive and a negative. It's, it's not just the fear response. There's also something that, that I think is really positive in this regard, which you probably know about, the Mendota Juvenile Treatment Centre. Um, that it'd been, it's been said for years that there's nothing you can do about this condition. But in the early 90s, um, mid-90s, in Wisconsin, they actually did a massive study where they separated two groups of uh, juvenile, juveniles who'd committed criminal acts. And the one set were the control group, and they were just left in the normal reform system. And the other group had very intensive counseling and support. And they found in the follow-up that, because it'd always been thought, there's nothing you can do about this. They found in the follow-up that, in fact, um, the control group did some pretty nasty things, but the, the kids who'd been through this program had a much, much lower um, recidiv recidivism rate. So, you know, I think there were uh, 16 murders <laughs> committed by members of the control group, and um, I'm not sure there were any by, by the other group. Um, that's talked about in Kent Keel's book, The Psychopath Whisperer. Yeah, I, I think that... <laughs> The way so there is that, something that can be done, which is, is really important. Right. The way that people see people with narcissistic personality or antisocial is that the way that they talk about them, and even clinicians, is like they're an alien race from Mars yes. or something. Witches. Yeah. yeah. They, they're us. We are them. They are, yes. we, yeah. you know, they're human beings. And although some of the things that they think or do are very foreign to the average person, they still share most of their basic humanness with, with the rest of us, meaning that they appreciate being comfortable, for example. <laughs> they don't like to yes. be in prison. They, they appreciate, um, to some extent, um, people who approve of them. You know, they're not like completely like just divorced from actual human interaction or being interested in pleasing other people now and they, they might they have take, take they, pleasure they, in life yeah right they might have some very deep defenses and resentments against people developed through life or you know maybe they were born with something that made it harder for them but they they also do have sort of a, a version of empathy in a sense you know they're not just completely divorced from that now for some of them, the way that they will choose to see certain behaviors um, often involves some of their defenses or, and or they, they don't have this, the same mechanisms that other people have that will drive behavior. But, mm -hmm. the, but they're not completely different from us. Therefore, when they are suffering and we are talking to them and they can, you know, when we listen and they get some emotional regulation skills. They get some support. They get some life skills. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're connected to someone who believes in them. There are natural things that are going to be beneficial to any human, and, and people with psychopathy are, are no different. Now, can, are some people with psychopathy so hell-bent on not letting anything like this work and so hell-bent on uh, harming other people? Yes, and, and some who have extremely destructive urges of sadism and of, you know, raping other people and this kind of thing. Absolutely. There are decidedly monsters, but, but they're humans, you know, but at the same time, those aren't the people that are in this study. You know, the vast majority of these kinds of people um, are, I believe, reachable um, and, and have been reached according to, you know, evidence. You know, we need a, a better understanding. I, I don't remember his name, but the 
the chap who wrote Amazing Grace, the song Amazing Grace, was the captain of a slave ship who had realized that that was really not a good thing to have been doing. And it shows that somebody who has done atrocious and dreadful things, uh, in his case, it was through a religious conversion, but that they, they can understand what they've done. They can take responsibility for it. That can happen. But I do think that the, for anybody to, you know, for, for those of us with sort of regular empathy, we understand the emotional consequences of what we do. And people can tell us that we're upsetting other people and that will possibly distress us and we won't want to do it. If you're doing with somebody who doesn't care about upsetting other people, then you have to frame it in a way that the consequences upon them, you know, how will it affect them? That if they upset other people, the consequence will be those people won't spend time with them, won't buy the products from them or, or whatever. Understanding things in a more selfish way. I think there's another thing, the, the high risk taking is one of the things that fascinates me about the whole of the psychopathic construction, that maybe these are people who don't have an easy dopamine release. Maybe they don't get pleasure easily. The reward system in the brain is not functioning. So they have to do more extreme things to get a sensation, you know, in the same way that people who are significantly masochistic in their sexual behavior, you know, you hear about people who deliberately go out to get themselves beaten up because that gives them pleasure. The, you know, so having their bones broken. I, I met a young man like this when I was a teenager and found it very shocking when he told me that he'd joined a motorcycle gang so that they would beat him up because he liked that. But things can go wrong in, in the wiring of the brain and the, the dopamine, serotonin, whatever responses can be the wrong way on. So we might even be looking at something physiological there that, that we might be able to do something about. Until we can do something about it, if somebody is a criminal psychopath, we need to separate them from the, the population. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, you know, just because... And that's often what people will confuse with, it. you know, if I'm claiming that they're not from Mars, somehow they're like, well, what is supposed to forgive them? I'm like, no, absolutely. Like I, if, if they're um, going to, you know, the justice system is there for a reason. Um, we've sort of drifted into psychopathy. I want to get back to narcissism okay. um, um, because, you know, they're different that you can, they're related on some level, but um, they're really quite different experiences in my clinical experience. Um, what other figures have you studied? Um, David Koresh, do you want to talk about Donald Trump? Um, other kinds of people, who, who else have you looked into? Um, you, you mentioned well, the moon. Let's talk about Donald Trump um, quickly. The guy who wrote the entry for the Narcissistic Personality Disorder in DSM-4 actually published an article um, appeared in New Scientist some time ago saying, you know, Donald Trump is, does not have the narcissistic personality disorder. I'm the guy that wrote the entry. And I can tell you. Now, he also talks about, um, you know, the rule that you shouldn't diagnose somebody that you haven't interviewed. Was that the Goldman rule or something? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I'd like to point out that he hadn't interviewed Donald Trump, so he couldn't diagnose him one way or the other. But I think that, you know, this casual, you know, the division that's happened in the United States, uh, which has been going on for a long time, but, but it, it really does seem rather toxic now. The, um, you know, we hate Donald Trump because of this. Um, it's certainly not for me and not for, you know, public untrained people. You know, you're in a situation where you have some training to, to look at this. I don't. And I think this you know, howling about him being a nasty, you know, having MPD is, is, you know, not necessarily helpful. No, it's highly problematic. And, and yeah, uh, not only just ethically speaking, uh, we need to have a line and it's there for a reason. It's, it's a fairly obvious line. It's like, 
if you haven't assessed someone, you can't diagnose them. Pretty, pretty, pretty easy thing to say. You know, I can't, a physician can't look at someone across the road and say that person has lung cancer. You know what I mean? It's like, you just can't do that. And the rule applies here. And then, you know, the just, it's just obviously a bias and every president has had some clinicians who have diagnosed them with NPD. And it's like, it just becomes meaningless. You know, it's just, it just, it's just evidence of your, of your partisanship, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Emory University, um, while Obama was, was still president, assessed every president up to Obama and determined that all of the popular ones were narcissists. Right. I mean, even Chester Arthur, one of our presidents people don't even remember, you know, was diagnosed as having narcissistic personality disorder. And I just find that to be, one, unethical, two, just completely wrong-headed because, again, that's a gross misunderstanding of narcissistic personality. Now, if you think the person's arrogant, that's a non-clinical statement. You can just be like, yeah. ah, you know, Donald Trump is arrogant or Donald Trump is self-centered. It's like, okay, you know, it's fine. There's, there's not a clinical statement there. It's yeah. an opinion. It's a, it's a descriptive adjective. It's fine. You could, you could also say Donald Trump's a jerk. You know, there's no DSM diagnosis for being a jerk. It's, it's, not it's yet. Funny. You could say that, but to claim that, you know, <laughs> one, what narcissistic personality disorder is, which alone is quite a claim, even within clinicians, I find that mm. many don't understand it. And two, that you could actually assess someone by watching, you know, Fox News is, is, is just absurd. And it doesn't it seem to be that whenever a, a term, a medical term enters popular culture, it's immediately misdefined. So schizophrenic is held by most people to mean multiple personality. Right. OCD means you're clean. Yes, exactly. You wash. <laughs> yeah. um, people are called paranoid um, when they're actually anxious. You know that these words, uh, the word "depressed," instead of saying that pe- somebody saying, oh, "I was unhappy," "I was sad," they'll go, "I was depressed." And you go, "Well, do you mean endogenous depression or reactive depression?" And obviously, they give you a funny look. <laughs> what are you talking about? Because it's only endogenous or internally generated depression that is depression. If you know your girlfriend's just left you, or your boyfriend or whatever has just left you, you're not depressed. You're unhappy. That's what's called a reactive depression. But these terms, I suppose, they make us sound as if we know what we're talking about. It bothers me that so many authors these days start talking about the brain, and they start, you know, saying this or that about the amygdala or or left brain, right brain or something. Left brain, right brain from those early 60s studies where the corpus callosum was cut in epileptics. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I love the work of um, Robert A. Burton. Um, he wrote a book called, he was the head of neurology at Mount Zion, uh, UC San Francisco. And he wrote a book called On Being Certain, which is mind boggling. It's just a wonderful book about why are we so sure of things? You know, uh, what do we believe and what do we actually know? And then he wrote a book called A Skeptic's Guide to the Brain. And in that, he criticizes the what he considers the overly positive assertions of most of the workers in this field, um, including, say, Damasio and Ramakandran. He doesn't say anything about Oliver Sacks because we would never criticize Oliver Sacks. And he's not saying their work is wrong. He's saying they're a bit overconfident about what this means you know it, it sounds as if we know more than we do um and it's the point of view that you put at the start of this conversation that that, that we we know some things and you know in a hundred years time people will look back and and say you know as they do in sleep or you mean they didn't know that burgers and fries are the basis of a healthy diet you know <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and um i'm interested in uh picking up some of those books um <laughs> So, uh, well, okay, so we got Donald Trump off the list. Now, in my deep dives on narcissistic personality, I actually, you know, after seeing all that kind of stuff right there, which I go on for, for a while, I actually do kind of go through some, some things that we have seen from him that you could say, well, you know, maybe, but there's, there's really no way to know. And if I had data on Obama, I could, you know, sort of say the same thing. But anyway, um, so if you want to listen to that, you get to listen to those episodes. But the point is that I want to get to you. <laughs> we will. Is, we all will. <laughs> is um, what other figures, uh, you know, that because I'm, I'm guessing for people to, you know, understand these sort of extreme examples of, shall we say, 
narcissistic, extreme narcissistic personality people who actually involve themselves in cults to, you know, give them their narcissistic supply. Who who else could you point to? Well, the, the great leaders of the 20th century cults, the Adolf Hitler, um, provides quite a study um, that here is a man who who fits the classic pattern that that he uh, was abused throughout his childhood. Um, he was rejected when he wanted to go and be an art student. Um, though as the producers points out, he was a great painter. He could do a whole apartment, two coats in a single afternoon. Um, and when you look at his early, you know, his career as a soldier, he was called the White Crow by his fellows. He was a corporal. He won the Iron Cross for bravery. Um, but nobody liked him. And that's something about Hubbard that, looking at his childhood and, and later, he seemed to have these very close relationships or what seemed to be close relationships with individuals for a very short period of time. So, you know, for six months when he was in East Grinstead in the 1963, in one lecture after another, he talks about his great friend, Reg Sharp. And um, Sharp, you know, a year later is thrown out having written a book that's published. Um, by Scientology. So they take people to them and they sort of vampirically suck them dry. Um, Hitler too would, you know, have a close confederate, uh, you know, there are many examples, but Eric Rome, the head of the SA, which was the group of thugs that put Hitler into power. No two ways about that. And he has them all murdered, the Knight of the Long Knives. Um, and replaces them with, replaces him with Himmler and the SS, should stuff him. Um, so, and, and maybe it's true of Mao Zedong that if we look at him, it, it is, it's been said that he spent more of, most of his reading time was not reading Marxist literature, but reading histories of the emperors of China and that he considered himself an emperor. And when you look at the way the uh, Cultural Revolution happened, the first of the student revolutions of the 60s, um, he kickstarted that. He's the guy that went to the, you know, having stood back from power at that point, he then gets the students to perform. You know, they, they killed tens of thousands of people. They buried their university professors alive. You know, I mean, things have got bad in the US sometimes, but we've not seen anything on that sort of scale. And it seems to me that it was about his image. It was about him being perceived as as this god among men, which of course he achieved. To this day in China, there are still massive posters of Mao Zedong, and he's considered to be this great liberator, though of course he's the greatest mass murderer in all history, probably. I mean, Genghis Khan did pretty well too, but uh, it's estimated that over 20 million people were killed by Mao. Yeah, so it's interesting about Hitler. I haven't studied him uh, as much as you have, but you know, being, I don't know, on this planet growing up in this time, you just can't get away with knowing some things. And, and the, uh, it's interesting to look again, it's from afar, so there's no way to know for sure, but, but it's interesting to think of uh, him through the narcissistic personality lens, yeah. someone who was very interested in being, you know, because he was suffering deeply on the inside, which I think there's evidence of, right? Absolutely. Oh, and how? I mean, he, he was, um, his doctor's um, notebooks became available only a couple of years ago. And we find that he was on a massive dose of amphetamines on a daily basis, you know, so he will have been a very unhappy bunny. He was also the first person to have fecal transplant, um, which is a, you know, a questionable practice, which is now going on all over the West, where you take... Um, material bowel material from a healthy person and put it in the bowel of an unhealthy person in the hope that whatever's in there will do some good well his doctor records making little pills from ss men's excrement which hitler would swallow <laughs> so you know his doctor wasn't necessarily very helpful either but no he was a very unhappy man he was a very ill man um and there's this peculiar situation that when you look at the nazi system 
he was he was a very lazy man that was the other thing that i got about hubbard that he spent a great deal of time on holiday he spent a great deal of time just sitting around doing nothing um and then he'd go and give a you know three 40 minute lectures in a week and that that would be him done um hitler too spent most of his time reading the newspapers and would you know let his uh gauleiters his followers battle it out between them so you know there there are many comparisons that could be made right and and so you you know again through the lens it, again it's just narrativizing something that's hard mm. for us to to know for sure but yeah. he um doesn't it doesn't go well for him as a painter and she's just wonder about the world if he had been accepted into art school but he <laughs> uh, turns to I don't, you know i'm sure there's a lot of detail in terms of like his path but eventually he finds himself in politics and he finds that uh, he he can actually get quite a bit of narcissistic supply by um, getting people to listen to him talk and by getting people to support his political opinions. And he saw a niche at the time in history in Germany. They were reeling from the economic troubles after World War One, and from the the you know the lack of. Uh, feeling like Germany was on the decline, you know, make Germany great again was his slogan, I'm sure. <laughs> and he was, um, you know, uh, he was very good at knowing how to get people to respond to him. He was, he was a master at propaganda, him and his, you know, close compadres and was, you know, like, I can't remember if this is true. Maybe, you know, but, there's evidence or maybe speculation that, you know, he would practice in the mirror how to, how to look as he gave well, speeches. I, I was, I was just about to talk about that. Uh, in 1927, um, Hitler published a series of, of studio portraits, um, which were taken by Heinrich Hoffmann, who, who would be his personal photographer from then to his death. And they are a series of poses. This was a massive bestseller eventually in in germany sorry with the, the photos were taken in 1927 they were published in 1931 and they're pictures of him pulling faces and you know making gestures exactly as you say he'd practiced in the mirror and if if you watch triumph for the will and i think everybody should watch triumph for the will it's a remarkable piece of documentary making very innovative but it also when lenny riefenstahl talked about making that film she said that it took six months to edit three days to film six months to edit because he kept picking his nose or you know so he had a set of rehearsed gestures that he would fall out of and then he'd go back into them so yeah he was he designed a persona to impress you can look at the same thing with margaret thatcher and i'm not for a moment suggesting that margaret thatcher was or wasn't a narcissistic personality but if you watch film of her before she became leader of the conservative party in britain um she has a different voice she has a different posture she was trained to you know talk down to people in a certain way and and to walk and carry herself in a different way and i think that is part of you know in her case it was political expediency she was the first british politician to hire an advertising agency and every one of them since has hired an advertising agency and i think that that leads us into this area where narcissism has become popular you know i i hear about uh, the sociopath sites where uh, you know your girlfriend's broken up with you and you never want to be hurt again so you can go to this site and they will train you into having no emotions they'll train you into never being hurt again and i think because our society is so narcissistic and it rewards narcissism you know we admire people because they're selfish because they're greedy you know the the movement in this society in the last 40 years has been phenomenal naomi klein uh, reported that in 1980 uh, when ronald reagan became president the average ceo earned 40 times what what a blue collar worker would earn by 2000 it was 411 times so we've seen this creation of this these super rich people who are kind of expected to be narcissistic they're kind of expected 
to be Kim Kardashian or whatever and to behave in this way publicly. And I don't see that as a failure in, in religious morality, as many people do. I, I see it as a, fa a lack of a compass, as a lack of understanding that to be a, a happy human being, you know, uh, from criticized Freud for, for saying selfish people only love themselves and said, no, they, they don't love anybody. They can't love themselves, as I said before. And I think that this, you know, that developing a self is a way of becoming autonomous emotionally and intellectually is a way of being happy. It's a way of, or, you know, being as content and comfortable as we can in the world. Whereas developing narcissism, you are bound to lose. You are bound to come a cropper if, if, if you develop these negative traits. And because how can you like anything if, if, if your whole uh, being is, is focused upon being adulated, you know, and being important or significant. Yeah, and being superior to others and yeah. dominating. And, <laughs> What's an idea? <laughs> and, you know, not having a reciprocal, a, you know, attuned, liked relationship between you and someone else, but one that is more unidirectional. Um, right. And then that's really the tragedy of the narcissistic personality is that by attempting to defend against a deep emptiness that can only really be filled by actual connection with other people and people mirroring them. Um, they defend against that deep emptiness by propping up this false self. And what this requires is that they have to socialize other people to um, prop it up as well. And um, this pushes people away or at the very least pr prevents them from, you know, really caring for who you are on the inside. You know, they might like you from what you're presenting, but narcissistic personality people, when they really think about it, when they're really faced with it, you know, I think with Hubbard was an example of this. They realize like, look, these people don't like me. They like this version of me. And yeah. this is just more evidence that I inherently deep down in an unlovable, inferior, empty shell of a human being. And and that's the that's the true tragedy of this, and and that and without any guidance, without without any understanding of this, that they, you know they just they just continue to suffer and or um, abuse people along the way, and maybe even create future generations of people with narcissistic personality. Um, it's you know it's really it's really a tragedy, and when we're on the internet, you know, just sort of throwing around narcissistic personality you know, and labeling everyone like this, it diminishes it and makes it seem the way people talk about it in the media is basically just like, well, I don't like what this person is doing and they annoy me and it, and I'm jealous and I wish that they didn't, they weren't famous or something, you know, it's just, yeah. just some kind of weird narcissistic reaction in and of itself. You know, like I, I envy this person's fame and their power and, I want. I need some way of tearing them down. So I'll just. I'll just claim that they that they're a narcissist, and and then that will elevate me because I've now demeaned them. You know, now I'm I'm superior to Kanye West because he's a narcissist. You know, um, and uh, and what it ends up doing is is everyone's missing the point that the people with narcissism are suffering deeply, and if we can actually access that, and I have clinically, I've. I have people who have full blown NPD and, and there's a way of accessing their true self. It takes a long time and there's a, there's a lot of distrust and a lot of resentment and a lot of things you have to wade through and, and they will present in ways that can be quite troublesome because they, they come across like they don't care about people. They do. They just have trouble accessing that. And, um, and then, you know, the cycle just can be broken. You can actually help someone to um, recover and, you know, hopefully stop hurting other people along the way. Um, anyway, I'm rambling. but No, no, I, th I think it's a very interesting ramble. I, I think oh. it, the, the, what you're saying is, is possibly the most important thing that we've said, that, that you have personal experience where you've been able to help people who have this disorder to come to terms with it. And and live a better life and and that's fantastically important that's remarkably important kirk well you're 
giving me my narcissistic supply, John. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're going to build you up. We're going to build you up. You're going to be 19 feet tall by the time we're finished. <laughs> um, we, we have a, one of our members of our advisory board, uh, Dan Shaw, wrote a book called Traumatizing Narcissists, which is fairly technical, but but pretty interesting. His, his, in an, he was a member of a Hindu-based cult uh, as a young man. And uh, so he has that perspective, and he's helped a lot of people recover from their cultic experiences. But he sees the cult leader or the, you know, the abusive spouse in a very similar light. It's just the scale of what they're able to do that, that they're narcissistic. And I, and I think that the essence of, of you know, which we're agreeing on is that these people will they'll destroy the people around them and they'll destroy themselves. And so getting it over that, that, that you know, there, there is a way that you can find help and that if you, your life is influenced by a narcissist, then understanding, you know, you can still love somebody who's a narcissist, but you need to understand them. I have a, a counselor friend who, when somebody comes to her and, and they'll say they're depressed or they're anxious or what have you, one of her first questions is, are you involved with a difficult person? And um, it's just a beautiful choice of word that, you know, she's not making some, you know, malevolent judgment about this person. She's saying, is there somebody difficult in your life? And often people will, you know, if you said, well, you know, are you living with a narcissist or a psychopath? They'd just clam up. But if you say a difficult person, then they'll say, well, yes, actually, you know, my husband is a bit difficult. Um, and then you can say, in what way are they difficult? And you can, you know, without making those judgments, you can get that, you know, get that material out there. Um, so, which is to say that, that actually a huge amount of people are involved in abusive relationships, whether it be with a um, political group or a, a pseudo-religious group. Uh, I mean, we're at Open Minds Foundation at the moment. We have a real focus on why don't people report child abuse? Uh, you know, we're looking at these massive scandals. You know, the Roman Catholic Church, 8,000 children were abused by 500 priests in Australia alone. Uh, 34 bishops have just offered their resignations in May in, in Chile because they covered up um, the rape of children. Um, and, and a new scandal has just broken about a, a um, home for children in Scotland run by the Catholic Church where children were being systematically abused. But it's also happened in the Anglican Church. It's also happened in the Methodist Church. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses allegedly have a list of 23,000 abusers that they, the names they will not release to legal authorities. Um, and they lost a case in 2015 here in England where they were ordered to pay 300,000 know, pounds, about $400,000, um, to the victim of abuse because they knew that the person they were putting this then child with was a convicted abuser. You know, they knew that this person had done this. And we then find that they had a recruitment program in prisons where they would find people convicted of child molestation and, um, you know, bring them into the congregation and then give them access to children. We've had it in the Boy Scouts. We've had it in cadets. We've had it in uh, football coaching. We're seeing this in children's homes all over the world. Why don't people report this? Because... For every abuser, there are probably about 10 people who have some knowledge of it. When you know, our, our starting case in the UK was Jimmy Savile, the obscene disc jockey, who uh, is said to have been involved in at least 500 cases of abuse of people from the age of two to the age of 90. He was given the keys to Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital uh, so that he could wander at will through there. He was supported by Margaret Thatcher. He was supported by Edwina Curry, who was the Minister uh, for Health, I think, at the time. And we now find that there were hundreds of complaints against him that the police just ignored because he was Jimmy Savile. So 
thing I'm working on at the moment, we've just published a book called Uncensored by a woman called Barbara Anderson, who left the Jehovah's Witnesses when she realized that the cover up. And we're working with a group called SCARS in the US, who, that's S C A A R S, who, who are seeking to change legislation in the US um, concerning child abuse. You know, for one thing, we'd like to be rid of any statute of limitations on this. Um, but I would like to see naming and shaming of, of people, particularly in official positions, who failed to do anything. You know, we had cases where 13 year old girls here were being. Um, brought into prostitution rings, uh, particularly by groups of Kashmiri men in nearly 20 UK cities. And the one police force received, I think it was 83 complaints, which they didn't investigate because they thought it would be racist to investigate these Kashmiris uh, for some reason. And they believed that the 13-year-old girls had given their consent as if they could. You know, they were being plied with vodka and, and used as prostitutes. Um, so changing that culture and saying, let's have a culture where if you see something that's, that's going wrong, you report it and that, that you persist with the report. That This is something you know, at the Open Minds Foundation we're pushing towards at the moment and we're hoping to have some effect upon that. And yeah, that's happen. great. I'd, I'd be really curious to read what you've, fine regarding the factors involved and the uh, lack of reporting. Mm. Yeah. The, you know, you, you touched on a lot of it cause I've thought about it too. I was just like, why, you know, cause if we think about other kinds of crimes, say, uh, you know, a priest decides to, um, you know, he takes a knife and stabs a kid or something, mm. or he, Steal something. Yeah, steal something. Yeah. Push a kid down the stairs. You know, he pushed 10 kids downstairs. It's like, what's the chance that none of them are going to tell somebody, you know? Yeah. Um, or, or the people that they tell are going to cover it up. You know, it's, you're going to be like, you're, you're going to go to the priest, like, why are you pushing people down the stairs? Like, that's, you know, we have a no, you know, zero tolerance policy about pushing parishioners down the stairs, you know? Yeah. But somehow, when it comes to sexual abuse, it's just like, just this totally opposite reaction that actually upholds the abuse. And in addition to legislation and um, the fact that when people actually come forward, they are actually not supported. And so as a victim, if you're contemplating coming forward, you're like, Ooh, I don't want any of that stuff. You know, if, if you get um, pushed down the stairs and you come forward you know, 99% of the time they're going to be like, well, that, you know, that's not your fault. And who, you know, who did this to you? Let's, let's go justice for whatever reason. When you say I was sexually abused by my priest, there's, there's a good chance that, you know, people are going to push back. They're going to be like, well, do you have proof? You know, are you just saying this or, you know, let's look at this little, you know, or, you know, they'll, or, and, or they'll humiliate you and just be like, you're a, you know, you're a liar, you're psychotic, you're a slut or whatever it is, you know, they, she seduced me or something, you know? And so there's all that. But the other thing that I think it is another massive factor is that as a society, um, I just know about mine, okay. um, here in the Western United States is, you know, we're still, you know, puritanical about sex and it's, it's this holdover from hundreds of years ago about, you don't talk about sex and sex is dirty and sex is shameful. And um, now of course I think, that's, I think historically that it, it, it's a lot more recent than that. I, I think it's the late Victorian era in the 19th century, uh, you know, just before Freud realizes it, that sex becomes a taboo because if you look into the literature of, you know, say Rabelais in the 17th century, or, or you look into 18th century practices, sex was a lot more open. Then you've got the notions of privacy that came along in the middle classes in you know, the mid-Victorian area, let's say the 1850s. Um, and then this new idea about sex being shameful, because of course most children up until that period, living in peasant or, or poor families, working families, would have known that their parents were having sex. You know, because if you're living in two rooms, there's you know not a lot of hiding it. Right. So I think attitudes towards sex were were massively shifted, and it may even be that Freud made it worse by making it seem 
more taboo than it had ever been. Interesting. Uh, yeah, that's probably more accurate. Like yeah. King Jerome in the fourth century, you know, because Christianity had nothing against sex, really. That Jesus doesn't say anything negative, and Mary Magdalene, there is no evidence that she was a prostitute. That was invented somewhere around the fourth century when St. Jerome comes along and says women are bad, wicked, and dirty, and you mustn't have anything to do with them. Um, St. Paul did say it's better to marry than to burn. I I'm personally not sure. I've been married twice and burned several times. Um, but it, it, this emphasis, as you say, has become puritanical. And I think the U.S. is, you know, you have this fantastic Puritan legacy from Plymouth Rock onward. Um, I was reading somebody a year or so back talking about um, when massive banquets became popular in New York in the late 19th century. And so they'd have, you know, 17 courses, but they'd eat them as fast as possible and get indigestion, you know, because it was a bad thing to, to enjoy yourself. And I think that, you know, there is, whether that's anecdotal or not, there is that conflict in Western culture, that sense of guilt, particularly Protestant guilt. You know? Right. And so, you know, so the, the multiple cultural influences on uh, American society has created just a a lot of shame and since we're generally black and white you know animals mm -hmm. um we particularly about some th things that are taboo we just have this heuristic of just like well sex is dirty and shameful and and should not be talked about mm -hmm. and so when someone comes forward having been sexually abused the people hearing the reports have this have they just rely on this heuristic of just like ooh, this is dirty this is shameful um, I, by even listening to this story, I'm involving myself in something lewd. Um, if I'm interested in it or I pursue justice for it, does this mean I'm a pervert? You know, like there's just these really shortcut ways that people will react to things that, you know, like it uh, take a completely separate situation. You know, someone comes up to you at work and says, uh, it, which should be totally fine, by the way, uh, a friend of yours, let's just say a friend of yours, mm -hmm. a friend of yours comes to you, you know, you go to lunch on Friday and, and they come to you and they're like, oh my God, I have to tell you about what happened last night. It was really great. They're, and you're like, oh, what? And they're like, me and my spouse had the most amazing, dirty, sweaty sex. Let me tell you about every single detail. You know, most people would be like, um, what do you, no, I don't want to hear, but, but if, put it on YouTube. Don't tell me about it. Yeah. yeah. It, but you know, if you, if you talked about like an amazing movie you saw or an amazing meal you had somehow that's okay. But talking about sex, it's like, no, 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 no. And so even if it's not even related to sexual abuse, we're like, wait a second. Um, I don't want to hear it. It, by by even listening to this story, what does that mean about me? Am I am I a dirty, slutty, gross person? Even by by listening to this story, this whole thing grosses me out. Um, and so, because of all the messages we've been taught, and so when someone comes to you and says, "Oh, I've been sexually abused," that whole system kicks in of just like, "Ooh, I need to shut this down because you know I I can't participate in this." You know, yeah, even against it, their it, greater judgment of ra around like, wait a second, there's a there's a child here who is being victimized. Mm -hmm and a crime that's being committed and a, and a system that needs to change. And so, you know, it, I think that's another element among the multifactorial thing. This week, um, a documentary has been shown on uh, TV here uh, called Japan's Shame. And it's the story of a, a, a woman journalist who was raped. And um, she made the assertion that she'd been raped and she started getting death threats. She started... You know, people wanted to just shut up. And it's that kind of, you know, you're spoiling my buzz. You know, I don't want you to talk about that. And it, I think you're right. There's this whole attitude. Um, we need to get through this. The, the thing that perplexes me the most, and I have had direct dealings with this because, um, you know, people who've been sexually abused, who were sexually abused of children, who were involved in Scientology, have come to me and, you know, talk to me about what happened to them. And the the thing that I cannot really get past is these children told their parents. The same is true in the Jehovah's Witnesses. The same is true in the Catholic, Anglican, Methodist uh, churches. You know, let's not disinclude the Tibetan tantric sects and the various Hindu. You know, wherever you go, this this is there's some version of this going on. 
the parents have so often been told by the child and convinced by some authority figure in their church or their sports group, you know, um, whatever the organization is, the army cadets, uh, you know, hazing in, in US universities where people end up dead, you know, some of the things that are done, that the parents become involved in the cover up, you know, that, and that's the bit I want to get through to understand how you know, social compliance, you know, without getting into arguments about thought reform or mind control or what have you, but how regular social compliance leads people in our society to be willing to do that. You know, if, if somebody messes with, I have four children, if somebody messes with one of my four children or indeed my granddaughter, I'm right there. I, I'm not going to take that and it's not going to happen. You know, when my oldest boy was eight and came home from school and said that one of his teachers had threatened to strike one of the children, um, I phoned the headmaster up straight. Well, actually, I phoned up two mothers of children, one of whom said, yes, her child had said the same thing. And then I phoned the headmaster who laughed at me. He actually laughed at me when I said, this woman has threatened to strike a child. And uh, oh, my, my teacher wouldn't do that. Two years later, he thanked me. They'd have to dismiss the teacher because she'd struck a child. But it was, you know, you come up against this wall of disbelief and, and hopefully the events of the last 10 years will start, you know, and the Australian Royal Commission, I think, has been very important in this, will start to make a change so that reports will be taken seriously. 20 years ago, reports of domestic violence were almost ignored by the British police, and I'm sure by police forces in many places. Um, now the police have been retrained. We have the coercive control aspect of our Criminal Justice Act, which came in in December 2015. And, you know, it's accepted that, that psychologically controlling another person under law in England now, that's a criminal offence. Hitting them, that was already a criminal offence, but controlling them, coercing them into doing what you want, we're also recognizing, of course, um, a few weeks ago, it was announced that, that the number of slaves in Britain is probably double what had previously been estimated. And some of these slave, these slave situations are domestic situations where, you know, one person has brought another person into a relationship and enslaved them. Uh, which is the extreme of the narcissistic personality disorder making and people turn a blind eye they they look the other way and, and i think the culture is changing and i i think it might be the most positive change that has ever happened in human civilization where people start to take complete re responsibility for children and to protect children because just think of the amount of post-traumatic stress that is is running all rife through our society because of this abuse because of these poor people who have to then live with the after effects of being raped uh, and abused as children. And the trauma, sometimes worse, of the reaction once they come forward by yep. the their parents or their you know their friends or the police or the justice system or you know prosecutors or whatever, the reaction can be much worse because to me, it's, it's always been like, well, yeah, there's some bad apples in the world that will treat me and other people badly. But mm -hmm. to be let down by the general population and to be let down by, you know, the, the police system and the justice system and your family and, you know, that, that is so much more scary and, and traumatic. But, well, John, I, I want to let you go because we got to save some of your golden nuggets for the next time we talk. Well, let me just, just make a positive comment, having been so negative about Catholic Church. Yeah. Let me say that Pope Francis has said that it is a responsibility for all of us to take on the problem of child abuse and end it. So, you know, I, I'm with Pope Frank on that one. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, yeah. most people want to do something, but we have systems and culture that, you know, pushes against our better nature. Hmm. 
And and we, I think the thing is that we we need to take hold and do something. You know, at the Open Minds Foundation, uh, you know, our situation is we need help. We need contribution. We need people to come and give us a few dollars a month, or you know, write some positive comments, or send us blogs. Because I do think that between us, now that we're understanding this problem at last, and that it is all the way through our society, that between us, there are enough good-hearted people out here to do something about it. And I, I think it, you know, the change is going to come, as the as the man said in the song. Yeah, and your organization is there doing your part. We're doing our best, but we really do need support and contribution. You know, it. it you know, it, it's. I've had four years of doing this. And I'm exhausted uh, because there is so much to do. And we're, we're now involved with so many people, you know, as I say, with SCARS in, in the US, um, with the Radicalization Awareness Network, EXIT, which deals with violent extremists, PREVENT in the UK. We're trying to forge liaisons with organizations and say, look, and what these organizations tend to be doing, say that you're dealing with counter cult group, they go out and they teach kids about cults. And that's great. But that's not actually going to prevent you from joining a cult. You need to understand about narcissists, psychopaths, what I call human predators, and the techniques that they will use to seduce and recruit you. And by teaching those things to children and the intelligent disobedience that's advocated by my good friend Ira Chaleff, by advocating those things, we can actually change society and we can change it in a single generation. But we need to do something. We need to stop sitting about and chatting about it and get out there and teach people exactly what you are doing, Kirk, about the psychology involved and, and about, you know, what we can do about it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's really profound. Um, I, you know, I, I often think about what we are teaching our children and how we have such limited time while they're young to teach them critical things and how what I believe we're not focusing on some things and maybe over focusing on some other things. They're all important things, but, but we only have so much time to, uh, you know, help them. And, and, and that skill would just be so great if we could actually, uh, you know, if, if every kid graduating from middle school or high school had a, you know, a pretty good grasp on how, um, how coerce, co- coercive people or dominant people will actually like um, socialize you into their web. Um, mm-hmm. What a wonderful uh, society that, you know, would emerge from that would be just mm-hmm. great. I, I was um, talking to my friend, Steve Hassan the other week, and he, he was doing rounds at um, uh, Harvard medical school and a young psychiatrist stood up and said, you know, why don't we have a test for politicians, why don't we measure them in some way psychologically before? And and I sort of said, yes, you know, I've been saying this for so many years that to get a job in almost any profession, you have to have qualifications, all sorts of things have to have happened to get you there. To a politician, you just have to stand up and say, you know, make the Ukraine or East Africa or wherever great again. And people will vote for you. And we should you know, we should be measuring this, that if people have, are people of bad intent, we really shouldn't be making them leaders. We, you know, we really shouldn't be giving them power. And what we've seen, the corruption that's led to these child abuse scandals is all to do with that. It's all to do with there being police officers, judges, um, politicians. I mean, in the UK, a member of parliament, Cyril Smith, was most definitely involved in the abuse of children in, in two homes that he was a patron of, but he was an MP. He was a member of parliament for years. Nobody did anything. So having a, a different idea that, that morality is, you know, it is up to me. You know, I have to do something about this. You know, even if it's just write an anonymous letter about it. I, I had a case with... Um, at the case of what a horrible word. I have a very good friend who she's been on television and talked about it, so this there's no confidence involved here. She was sexually abused from the age of six when she was in Scientology. When she was eleven, she uh, one of her friends' mums was actually somebody who understood this kind of thing and took it to the police. And she wrote a full report of what had happened. 
and a woman called Jan Eastgate, and I'm happy to name her, and she can sue me if she wants, who ran a, a group called the Citizens Commission on Human Rights, a Scientology front group, Human Rights, went to this girl, 11 years old, and persuaded her to withdraw her evidence and sent her back into the household of the abuser for another five years. Now, what bothers me is that the police had a report from an 11-year-old, and they decided not to follow it up. You know? Wow. So we can all take responsibility. We can all do something about it and, um, you know, make the world change. But, but it's not going to happen simply by sitting and listening to me pontificating. We all have to actually do something. Absolutely. Well, thanks for joining me, John. Um, Always a pleasure. Yeah, I always learn something. I always, I always feel like I should be paying tuition when I talk to you. <laughs> well, I always learn something too, actually, Kirk. You're quite a clever fellow and you've done some very interesting things. So you know, the feeling's mutual. <laughs> and thanks for joining us out there. And everyone, please take care of yourself and take care of other people because we all deserve it.